Welcome, Climate Viewers. This is Jim Lee from Climate Viewer News at climateviewer.com. It is September 16th, 2021. And it's been a while since I've talked about some good old plane farts. So I'm going to respond to some viewer uh, mail and uh, just kind of clarify some things. And then at a later date, probably next couple videos, I'm going to be going into greater depth on this subject. If you're new to the channel, please hit that subscribe button. I'd greatly appreciate it. If you're new to the topic of uh, plane farts and cirrus clouds matter, um, we're not going to say the C word because the Google overlords and the AI will catch us in the act. Um, but let's just jump right into what we got here. So I got this beautiful email. It's reminding me how much I appreciate people who pay attention. And uh, it's responding to the International Civil Aviation Organization on August 30th saying, the latest issue of the World Civil Aviation Report has a comprehensive section that reviews how the air transport industry responded to pandemic challenges and how to build back better. Excuse me while I throw up in my mouth a little bit. Um, to which, uh, this beautiful individual responded at Qantas, the airline industry, airlines, um, Emirates airline and a whole bunch of other people added me in the United Nations environment program. Hashtag Cirrus clouds matter. We wouldn't, we would like to not observe net zero, but an absolute zero on contrail induced cloudiness over our cities and countryside. May the third wave of the coronavirus punch finally pin in the plane coffin. Nail in the plane coffin. Um, lot in there. Beautiful, ah, perfect little short um, jab at all the airline industry. So hashtag serious clouds matter. Something I came up with quite a while ago. Um, because what most people don't understand about whether you're talking about the sea trails or the other sea trails, um, it doesn't matter what you call them, but when they fan out and they spread out and they block out the sun, they become cirrus clouds. This is not an arguable, you know, thing, unless you just like being made fun of. Um, so to see uh, this gentleman, you know, replying to the ICAO and company um, with cirrus clouds matter warms my heart very deeply. And uh, then he makes a reference to absolute zero, um, something I just covered in another video um, about these agendas from 2030 to 2050 to reach absolute zero. Um, but I agree with him totally that we need absolute zero plane farts. Um, you know, at least, you know, of course, we're going to have plane farts for the foreseeable future, but at least, you know, it'd be very nice if those plane farts weren't making clouds and blocking out the sun and then them referring to it as accidental geoengineering. More on that in just a second. So why am I saying this? Because if you go to climateviewer.com slash cirrus clouds matter, you can read my frequently asked question page, my overview page on the subject. And as you can see, this was originally posted 2013, um, last updated 2017, is being updated right now. Um, so the next update will be 2021, of course. And it's going to be much more in depth and much easier to understand. Less lengthy, uh, more content. But regardless, in it, at the very top, I talk about the different types of chemtrails. Um, but regardless, uh, 
if you go right here to the very first one, how language controls the chemtrail debate. If you have not watched this presentation, I suggest you do. And it is carbon black dust, the chemtrail secret for weather warfare, geoengineering, and ozone destruction. And in here I have, uh, this video is 45 minutes long. And it comes with a nice PowerPoint presentation, which you can download. And it will literally go through everything you need to know about artificial cirrus cloud creation from the military side, from the commercial aviation side and everything in between. Um, and I really hope that you guys will take the time. If you're interested in this subject at all, met, are there metal in the clouds? How are the clouds made? What's the history behind it? How far does it go back? How does it affect life on earth? Um, you know, everything in between. Lots of facts you're not gonna see anywhere else. Um, and I hope that you guys will dig into that because there's a very long history um, and I've dated it as far back as 1958 where literally Palm Springs was complaining about them blocking out the sun and the Air Force gave the village two choices, live with the trails or move. So if you think this is a new problem, you're sadly mistaken. But the reason I bring up this page is because I have some, you know, typical what, you know, what Kim Trail debunkers say, what, how you should respond, all of that sort of stuff. Here are the facts. But these are all the different terms. Now you can search these terms. I believe search terms are very important because I believe that, you know, I can tell you till I'm blue in the face on a, on a thing, but you being able to learn for yourself um, is priceless. So all of these refer to the exact same thing. Chemtrails, persistent contrails, spreading contrails, contrail cirrus, Contrail induced cirrus, contrail induced cloudiness, aviation induced cloudiness. Uh, the ones with the acronyms are most widely used by the scientific community. Aviation induced cirrus, induced cirrus cloudiness. Man made clouds are just darn old artificial clouds. Because what does artificial mean? Uh, Man made or not natural. So, all of these refer to the same term and I, I typically just, you know, categorize all of my articles on the subject as artificial clouds. Um, because at the end of the day, the entire chemtrail conspiracy boils down to one thing, intent. And intent is something that's very hard to, to prove. If you want to you know, prove it in a court of law, pretty hard to do um, without some smoking gun, you know, I got the memo from the general that said he was going to geoengineer the whole damn planet. Um, so pretty tough to do, but you know, maybe one day we'll actually see that. I wouldn't hold your breath. Um, although if you, after you watch this video, you might want to hold your breath. Uh, regardless, let's dig a little deeper. So for those who want to know about chemtrails, I categorize them in five different categories, artificial clouds, kind of, kind of briefly touched that on that already, sounding rockets, rockets that intentionally release trimethyl aluminum, cesium, barium, strontium, lithium, um, in the upper atmosphere, biological warfare, chemicals released for various purposes, human testing, like zinc cadmium sulfide experiments of the fifties and all the way up to today with um, you know different uh, agent green that was sprayed on the cocaine and uh, weed crops down in South America and Mexico and then somehow made their way all the way back. It's a mold, a mold that's basically a fusarium that's now come all the way back to Texas. Um, and then weather warfare. So five types of real chemtrails with documentation. This is May, 2019. You can watch this video on YouTube or you can come check out the article. All the links to this uh, material will be published in the top comment pinned on this uh, article, on this video on YouTube. So um, 
there's that. Now, I got another email, and this is the most common question that I get from anybody. And this is the one that bugged me for the longest time. And I'm going to read it to you. So this comes from a Spanish speaking YouTuber who runs a prominent, um, you know, Spanish speaking YouTube channel. And he says, as far as geoengineering goes, I never really did any research specifically with the planes in the sky. I kind of acknowledge the geographical local effect where they fly, but that's all personally. I've spent more time studying solar cycles and gotten deep on the grand solar minimum research for our channel. Um, and I'm big on that too. You know, like I, I've, I've uh, met, you know, David Devine, um, adapt 2030. We've talked about grand solar minimum. Um, I've been meaning to set up an interview with Christian, uh, from ice age farmer. We connected v briefly via, um, email, but I was in the middle of, uh, my thyroid issues and, uh, we'll still try to hook that up in the future, but regardless, however, that doesn't mean I'm ignoring the geoengineering component. Lately, I've been watching several videos from your channel to get updated on what's going on. I really appreciate your approach on the matter. With that being said, I have only one question and I will really appreciate if you can give me your take. I'm 41 years old, and from what I remember as a child, I don't recall many planes in the sky like now. From what I perceive, it seems that there might be more planes doing geoengineering now than there used to be. If that's the case, when in time you think the activity in the sky started ramping up? Is there any chart or any statistic we could access to see time ranges versus quantity of planes in the sky or something like that. Now, that is a very well worded question. And the short answer is 1997. Um, 1994 to 1997, that's when the real uptick in, I would say, the change in background atmospheric aerosols leading to increasing artificial cloud creation began. Um, I will dig into this deeper in the future and I need to do some more research because, you know, like I said, I don't have it all figured out. I'm always looking for new information. If you guys uh, have some of that information, post it in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. Um, if you've got any new research on, um, you know, atmospheric composition of uh, different aerosols, uh, you know, quantitative charts, all that sort of stuff. Um, if you can provide me with accurate information on number of flights per year from the year 19, let's say 80 through present, if you can give me numbers on, you know, gallons of jet fuel used per year from 1980 to present that would be great too please leave me a comment if you could find any of this information you'd be helping me out um i will find it regardless but you sure could expedite the um search for that regardless let's get into what my answer is on this because i'm sure that a lot of people um are not familiar with this information so that's what we're going to do today real quickly. And I'm not going to read you this whole article because, you know, if you really want to know, you're going to have to read it yourself. But back in 2014, after about six years of research on this topic um, and being wrong so many times, I really wanted to come to some kind of consensus on where I think the problem lies. And everything kept going back to the jet fuel tank. And what I noticed that was highly coincidental was I said, let's start at the beginning. What was the first article ever written on the internet? When was the first time the word chemtrail was ever used? And the answer to that question is 1997. And the article was about JP-8 jet fuel. 
Now, in you know, the need to get this video out kind of quickly because it you know didn't get one out yesterday due to a massive water leak, which um, you know, I saved a thousand gallons a day apparently. Um, so I'm saving water, uh, but regardless, um, wasn't able to get a video out yesterday. So I wanted to get this one out today, but I will get a link to that article. I will find it on Wayback Machine if necessary, but I want to bookmark this for all time. The very And what I did was I went to Google and I went to the Google timeline, which allows you to actually see when a term and then when it was used and the articles associated with it. And the first article written on chemtrails was 1997. And that article was about JP8 jet fuel and how they noticed that they were producing way more clouds than before. This led me down a long path of reading a lot of very scientific military documentation along with peer reviewed journals. Um, talking about something called the single fuel concept. And the short and skinny of it is this, that the military, you know, has a real big gas bill. Um, in fact, there've been estimates that the United States military alone uh, burns more fuel and produces more CO2 emissions than the next five largest countries on the planet. Um, ex excluding China. Um, but regardless, it's a big fuel bill. And one of the problems they were having was that, generally speaking, planes were blowing up. They were using uh, jet fuel that was made of gasoline. During Vietnam, um, you know, the Viet Cong would fire AK-47s at F-4 Phantoms and the bullets would pierce the wings and then that would cause a spark and the planes would explode. Gasoline has a, a low flammability, um, you know, range. So just the slightest spark, boom, plane's gone. Um, similarly, people refueling planes, a spark would jump from the, the hose to the plane causing a fire, obviously killing soldiers, destroying vehicles. Um, it's a problem. So, you know, they were doing things like adding static dissipator chemicals to the fuel to try to cut down on that. Um, but at the end of the day, they, you know, they try to figure out how do we solve some of these problems along with how do we not have to use different fuels for all the different vehicles. Um, you know, the, the M1 Abrams tank is using this, the, the Hummer, you know, Humvee, um, Jeeps are using this and the planes are all using that. What if all of them could use the same fuel, one fuel for the battlefield to rule them all as they would put it. Um, and of course that's exactly what they did. So. I wanted to, some of this is background information on the article, so I'm going to skip past it because it's, you know, really about, you know, how do you detect geoengineering, um, you, know, you know, basically modifications to the dom nation's domestic jet fuel to do geoengineering, secret geoengineering, what, um, you know, some of the debunkers are saying, you know, that most people who talk about chemtrails believe it's actually covert geoengineering and this was a uh, mick west actually talking to ken caldera geoengineer understanding what covert geoengineering would entail and how it might be detected would allow a more rigorous debunking of various conspiracy theories um but in short that's not possible uh because you know diane seidel said you know we can't detect rogue geoengineering, which leaves us in this weird place where, you know, people like myself, I'm 44. Uh, the gentleman who emailed me, he's 41, can remember a time when it was not as cloudy as it is today. I was a Boy Scout. I was out in the woods every freaking weekend. Um, you know, as a child, uh, many of you probably had this experience. You were probably in the same age range. 
maybe some of you, you know, millennials or whatever, Gen Z, whatever the hell they're calling you now. Um, maybe some of you have experienced this, but when I got home, uh, you know, my grandma was taking care of me. My dad was working. They said, get the hell out the house. Dinner times at such and such time. See you then. <laughs> we were outside. So I was constantly outside looking at blue skies going, oh, look at the beautiful puffy clouds. Happy little clouds, as some would call them. Um, and then at some point, happy little clouds turned into, um, you know, basically clouds that covered the entire sky, gray skies on a daily basis. Um, and that's, you know, really where things started to get weird. And of course, I didn't notice this, you know, or really dig into this till I had a child and, you know, later in life. So I'm looking at all this. And of course, hindsight sometimes is 2020. Um, but this is a very cloudy subject to begin with. So I had to really dig deep to try to find, you know, what's up with this? You know, what's going on with the Contrail Series Simulation and Prediction Tool? Um, you know, the Aviation Environmental Design Tool. It, it just looks like there's a whole lot of people trying to control these clouds that are being made. Um, what's up with that? So the single fuel concept thing really is where I think a lot of the problems started. And um, you can see right here that basically um, the Army's problem had to do, all right, I, I talked about, you know, accidental, you know, the Vietnamese soldiers, C-130 crashed uh, accidentally uh, killing 23 and injuring 80 soldiers. The C-130 was eight able to land and the two F-16 pilots were able to eject. Unfortunately, the damaged F-16D crashed into uh, two C-141 Starlifters on the runway. 500 paratroops died in the fireball, which was attributed largely to the use of JP-4 in all three planes. Um, so this isn't, you know, this isn't a laughing matter at all. It, gasoline is explosive. Um, and this is kind of the genesis of the whole single fuel concept. The Army's problem had to do with D2, which is F-54 diesel fuel. Back in the 1980s, M1 Abrams tanks deployed in Germany wouldn't start when it got too cold. Apparently, the, when D2 got too cold, wax would form in the gas tanks and fuel lines. The solution dubbed M1 fuel mix was to mix F-54 diesel fuel with either JP-4 or JP-8 and call it NATO F-65. So already you can see um, that, you know, M1 Abrams uh, tanks in Germany weren't faring very well on this diesel fuel because they have paraffins in it. And that builds up wax. So the single fuel concept was first implemented December 1989 when JP-5 was used as the single fuel during Operation Just Cause in Panama. 1990, the DOD implemented the single fuel concept by providing Jet A-1, which was JP-8 without its three mandatory fuel additives for U.S. forces in Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm. During those operations, some Air Force units were located on bases where only JP-4, which could not be used in ground vehicles and equipment, was available. Some Army units requested diesel fuel instead of JP-8 because JP-8 did not make acceptable smoke in the M1 Abrams exhaust system smoke generators. Uh, for those who don't know what that is, you know, they basically they have these smoke launchers on the tanks so that they can obscure vision of enemy opponents. So the, the fuel plays a role in that, and the JP-8 just wasn't cutting the mustard, um, which would have reduced their initial concerns about using aviation fuels in ground vehicles and equipment. Despite these problems, the SFC was considered a success. Um, but then they go on to talk in depth about it, and uh, U.S. Army Colonel James E. Wright um, wrote a paper titled, what are the impacts to national security for the Department of Defense to comply with the mobility fuel requirements in the Clean Air Act of 1990? 
and he's specifically talking about the sulfur limitations. Now, if you're a truck driver, you're going to know exactly what I'm already talking about, about monitoring the sulfur output of your diesel fuel in your truck, in your tractor trailer. Um, it's a big deal. Apparently, <laughs> I know a couple of truckers and they complain about it heartily. Um, but regardless, you know, the EP, um, he says, interestingly, given the ability for the military to say to hell with the EPA, the good colonel opted for promoting the use of low sulfur fuels in the future to lead the world on being clean. And to that, I said, bravo, sir. Following the switch to JP-8 in 1988, Air Force Research Lab conducted tests on a new type of fuel additive in 1989. The high-temperature thermal stability HITS additive was designed to make JP-8 perform like JPTS, a special fuel in high-flying spy planes like the U-2. By the way, these are my words, not somebody else's words. Um, I wrote all this. Um at the time, JP-8 cost around 61 cents per gallon, and JPTS cost around 325 per gallon. I mean, that's just mind blowing in and of itself that you could get jet JP-8 jet fuel for 61 cents per gallon in 1998 or 89, um, and uh, the 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 most expensive uh, fuel for the U-2 spy plane is practically what we're paying for regular gasoline nowadays. Um, the Air Force Research Lab's HITS additive would give all the performance of JPTS for a few additional pennies per gallon. So they could basically take this additive, the high temperature thermal stability additive, and add it to JP-8, and they called it JP-8 plus 100. And it actually would only cost about, let's say, 80 cents per gallon as opposed to spending 325 per gallon. So you can see why this single fuel concept, you know, on paper from the military's perspective makes sense, but was there a hidden agenda, a side agenda? Was there more to the story than that? Um, well, I kept digging a little deeper. Propulsion research could revolutionize jet fuel. Development of a cold flow fuel additive can lower commercial airline operating costs, Air Force Research Lab Propulsion D Directorate Turbine Engine Division, Fuels Br Branch, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Um, and they talk about the JP-8 plus 100 LT for low temperature. Um, it shows basically over here on the side, this is JP-8 freezing, um, you know, and then this is JP-8 plus 100 crystal growth um, freezing. And as you can see, the ice particles are much smaller. Now, this is interesting because whenever you create these additives to make smaller particles, it would stand to reason that the burnt exhaust would also make smaller particles and smarter par particles stay in the air longer. Um, therefore, a gradual buildup in the upper atmosphere of said chemicals. Um, but to tie a bow on this, um, I really wanted to try to understand, you know, where was this, you know, headed? Um, and it, basically it says, um, according to the paper titled JP8 plus 100, the development of high thermal stability jet fuel dated October 13, 1997. There's that number again. Over 1,000 U.S. Air Force jets were already using the HITS-laden JP-8 plus 100, and the military planned to expand its use to all planes by 1999. So, at the end of the day, what we end up with is the history of jet fuel that... For quite some time, planes were running on gasoline. 1988, the single fuel concept begins. Conversion of JP from JP4 to JP8 begins. This is why I believe that 
we've really seen this massive uptick in you know aviation induced cloudiness as the gentleman so eloquently put it in the tweet um because cirrus clouds matter and seriously uh this type of fuel has a much higher um black carbon output metal output as we're going to see in just a second the metals that are in jp8 are much higher um than what's in jp4 and jp5 and that's where the problem really is so this is the single fuel concept from beginning to completion to the first time the word chemtrail was ever used on the internet. And those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. Um, we've come so far since the very first article using the word chemtrail being about JP8 to nobody remembering any of that and me having to figure this out over a decade later. So I'm just I'm just throwing that out there. Um, interestingly enough, other little timeline points in between. Um, they started the single fuel concept in 1998, 1988, 1992 was the stratospheric wells bag seeding patent. 1994, the plus 100 hits additive tests begin. 1995 was owning the weather in 2025 from Air Force 2025. 1996, conversion to JP-8 complete. 19, March 1997, the West Weather Modification Test Technology Symposium occurred, where Dr. Arnold Burns from the Phillips um, Lab in the Air Force Research Lab um, basically proposed everything that was in owning the weather in 2025 to the Air Force and Army, the Joint Air Force Army meeting, which is the same thing that's going on with the single fuel concept, Air Force, Army, all the militaries agreeing on using a single fuel. Um, to August 1997, with Edward Teller's geoengineering proposals for, from the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, you can read all about that in, on climateviewer.com. Dr. Evil's plan to save the world from... Uh, to save the world, a geoengineering tale. Um, and then finally, October 1997, plus 100 additive in 1,000 U.S. Air Force jets with uh, the intention to have it in every single U.S. Air Force jet by 1999. But this was also a NATO thing. And if you really look at it, what are we talking about with NATO? We're talking about all of these countries. And NATO basically has this thing called the NATO um, Fuels and Lubricants Working Group. And uh, basically, they handle the standards for all of the NATO fuels, all the NATO countries. So where have we seen reports of chemtrails around the globe, people raising hell about it? Well, um, look at the map. I mean, pretty much all those countries. I don't really see anybody in the you know Horn of Africa complaining about chemtrails. Not so much down here in South America as much, um, but all through the Northern Hemisphere, you know, that's where the bulk of the majority of these complaints come from. And almost all of them are NATO countries. So there you go. Um, is that a coincidence? I don't know. Let me know in the comments. Maybe I should put a tinfoil hat on. I'm just following the money. And the money is in the gas tank. What else is in the gas tank is metal and other chemicals. So I wanted to really dig into that. And um, what I saw was that basically all of these different um, additives are required in the different types of fuel. So you got antioxidants, static dissipator additives. That's the status 450 dinonyl naphthal sulfonic acid, DENZA. Um, which is a barium salt, anti-icing additives, corrosion inhibitors, metal deactivators, thermal stability additives, um, leak detection additive, tracer A, and then biocides like bioboard and kathon, which are designed to kill bugs growing inside the wings where they keep the fuel because it's a dark, damp space where bacteria grows. So, of course, 
they also put biocides into jet fuel. Um, when you really start to look into all of these different chemicals that are used in Jet A1, Jet A, you can see across here, F44, F40, these are the, the military standards, JP5, JP7, JP8, Jet B, um, and the list goes on. Um, you know, it basically shows you these are the additives per type, you know, of fuel, and that's that. So I was looking into what are in these things. And when you start to look at the actual, um, the additives themselves, it's pretty creepy because I went and pulled material safety data sheets for almost all of these. And when you really start to dig into them, you realize that a lot of them, um, they just, they say, you know, trade secret, um, you know, military secret. Don't talk about the weather. It's a military secret. So these are all of the different fuel types. These are all the different additives. And I promised the, uh, you know, the thing on metal. So let's go back here. I'm coming back to climateviewer.com slash Cirrus Clouds Matter. And like I said, this is a, a frequently asked question page. So you just click the little check marks you know plusers right here what makes a cirrus cloud carbon black does self-levitating cloud seed or cirrus clouds a bad thing right here are cirrus clouds filled with metal the ipcc report says yes me metal particles such as aluminum titanium chromium iron nickel and barium are estimated to be present in the parts per billion based on two 1975 freaking studies and i found that highly insufficient um, for IPCC to be relying on estimates from 1975 is a damn joke. Um, so I wanted to dig a little deeper and I found a couple of different ones. Uh, this one's absolutely great. And then I have the military's version, but the, this one right here, chemical characterization of freshly emitted particulate matter from an aircraft exhaust using single particle mass spectrometry this is from 2016, not 1975. The detected metallic compounds were all internally mixed with soot particles. Like I said, JP8 jet fuel, these diesel fuels, um, even the Jet A, they're all they all burn dirty exhaust. And one of the dirty exhaust elements is soot or carbon black or black carbon. Um, these are often used interchangeably. This is explained in my presentation. Um, often misused, but it is a grape-like substance that attracts water readily. It is a great cloud seed. Um, carbon black dust is the weather weapon of choice from the Owning the Weather in 2025 paper um, from... Um, Dr. Florence Flint Van Stratton, 1958 uh, from the U.S. Navy. She was using carbon black to, to make clouds and to destroy them. Um, so we know that carbon black or soot um, is the cloud seed that water sticks to. So when everybody tells you, oh, it's just water vapor, um, but then it's sticking to something and it has to stick to something in order to form a cloud. It's not just forming ice that's just hanging out there. It's sticking to something that seed is soot filled with metals. What metals you're probably wondering? The most abundant metals in the exhaust are were chromium, iron, molybdenum, sodium, calcium, and aluminum. Also detected in these particles coming out of the back of jet fuel being burned by a plane and measured by very highly accurate um, scientific equipment. Vanadium, barium, cobalt, copper, nickel, lead, magnesium, manganese, silicon, titanium, and zirconium. Now, all of these are metal nanoparticles. These are being spread all over the globe to the tune of around 150,000 flights per day. Now, also in the beautiful gentleman's uh, tweet was the fact that he said that he hopes the third wave of Corona puts the nail in the coffin of the airline industry. 
as we've noted, some of you may have noticed, I've noticed it in South Carolina, not so much in other parts of the country because I've, I've seen the videos, I've gotten the photos. I appreciate everybody who reaches out to me at Jim at climateviewer.com um, or tweets, you know, shares stuff with me on Facebook. I watch it all. I can't respond to it all. It's overwhelming. I have kids in a life and trying to, anyway. Um, not everybody's experiencing it, but during the last two years, there has been a de marked decrease in the number of flights because of the 19 virus. Um, anyway, that's going to probably lead to some pretty interesting scientific um, studies in the near future. I cannot wait to read the first one that really breaks down the decrease in aircraft traffic and what effects on the climate and or temperature, rainfall, UV index, that sort of thing. Um, if anybody finds any papers on that, immediately send them to me. I will shake your hand vigorously, pat you on back and make video immediately upon reading that because I'll either agree or disagree or argue or want more information, but I'm dying to know. Um, but according to the military's own uh, paper, trace element and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon analysis of jet engines fuel, uh, jet A, JP5, and JP8, what you see right here is aluminum. It says not detected in jet A. I find that hard to believe. Um, JP5, 2144 parts per billion. JP8, Aluminum, 9,300 parts, 9,360 parts per billion. So, I mean, are we following the pattern here? Even more damning. And at the time, I didn't put an arrow on this infographic when I made it because I didn't really think it was necessary. But right now, in this moment, we've switched from talking about using sulfur in geoengineering and aluminum in geoengineering to now the big one is let's use calcium in geoengineering. Calcium in Jet A is 555 parts per billion. Calcium in JP5 is 5,000 parts per billion. That's 10 times. Calcium in JP8 fuel is 31,000 parts per billion or 31 parts per million. If you do not think that that amount of metal particulates going out into the atmosphere out of all of these NATO planes worldwide on a daily basis flying to and fro high in the altitude, not, in, not necessarily in the stratosphere where the geoengineers would like to put all the chemicals, but still spreading this thin veil of chemicals all over the planet, then you are delusional. Um, magnesium went from 1,000 to 5,000. The list goes on. Sulfur, 450 to 1650. Titanium, 35 parts per billion to 1,000. I mean, all down the board, everything's dirtier in the JP8. So much more metals were spread all over the globe as a result of the single fuel concept, which occurred from 1988 to 1997. The first article on chemtrails was in 1997. That article was about JP8 jet fuel, and I think rightfully so. So I hope that this answers the question I got via email. Um, because I think it's a good question. Um, you know, I remember it being blue too, and I want to know why. So I dug into it, um, and that, th that's where this led me. And like I said, um, go back over here. We'll go back to the article real quick. After I came to all these conclusions, I, you know, I put, put it squarely at the feet of NATO working group number one, special tasks which takes on special tasks as directed by the NATO Pipeline Committee. So literally a small group 
in the NATO pipeline committee of which their names are classified because I was never able to actually find them. Anybody can find them for me. Please uh, forward that to me because I'd love to call them and ask them some questions on this. But this NATO pipeline committee determines the, the jet fuel standards for 28 NATO member states. And as a result, this one group special tasks, if their special task was to geoengineer the planet using dirty fuel filled with metals they knew would block sunlight and in fact aluminum sulfur and calcium have all been proposed as geoengineering material and they happen to be in high quantities in the fuel that they ended up deciding to go with then there is a small possibility that individuals at the working group number one are to blame for special task project cloverleaf special task geoengineer jet fuel um and that is my belief but i don't have facts to squarely put it at the feet of these individuals you be be the judge let me know in the comments what you think. Do you think I'm on close to the money or if I'm just out of my freaking gourd? I'm sure there's going to be a whole lot of people who will have a problem with that. Um, you debunkers, you never sleep. I swear to God, you're paid to do what you do. Um, but that has led to the whole biofuels for contrail control, which is a video for another day. Um, jet biofuel enlisted for contrail control. Um, and, you know, things like chicken fat fuel emissions, uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, the access program, alternative fuel effects on contrails and cruise emissions, um, you know, all of these different things. So there's the timeline. And then I have a whole bunch of papers underneath here, you know, about this. And I mentioned the weather modification test technology symposium specifically because they say, um, these are current capabilities as of 1997, and it says very clearly right here, cloud modification surveillance coverage. This is a U.S. Air Force document from the Phillips Lab. Create, suppress, serious contrails. Cloud modification, current capabilities, 1997, create, suppress, serious contrails. Ionospheric modification, like heart. Um, anyway, so there's that. And uh, we're going to go down here to the very, very bottom. Because, you know, I make my conclusions. I will link this article. You can read it all um, yourself. And I, of course, went and made a special thanks to U.S. Air Force Chief uh, Master Sergeant Sam Powers, who happens to be my stepfather. He was a corrosion and fuel specialist in the U.S. Air Force. And um, I met him for the first time when I was like, uh, tw well, second time, when I was like 20 years old at Offutt Air Force Base as he was retiring after 30 years in the military. Um, you know, I stayed with him, him and my mother for a brief while. And then years later, after I finished this article, and I learned about JP8 and I learned about the single fuel concept. I thought to myself, well, this is a no brainer. I should call mom and get Sam on the phone and ask him what he thought about this. And when I explained it to him, he starts to chuckle and no shit. This is exactly what he said. Jim, when we switched from that gasoline to that diesel fuel, we effed up every single engine we had. We had, um coking which is carbon black soot buildup inside the engine so bad that we had to redesign the fuel distribution systems um the spray nozzles inside the jet engines um basically as he put it that fuel is shit um so it confirmed everything he confirmed for me from firsthand experience what i had confirmed um, through all of this research. So I believe I'm on the money with this, that there is a link between 
NATO, the single fuel concept, the switch from gasoline to diesel fuel, and all of the metal particulates and soot emissions, black carbon emissions, carbon black dust emissions that have come from all these military planes. And now this has trickled over into the commercial aviation industry where um, the United States military is now going with Jet A, um, Jet A-1 to be specific. Uh, and I believe I had that somewhere right here. Uh, February 2014, U.S. Defense Department switching to civilian grade jet fuel um, with testing of civilian grade jet A with additives nearly complete. 36 military bases in the U.S. have converted away from military grade JP-8. Um, the remaining more than 230 locations are slated to convert in 2014, um, which again was another time that people refer to. They say that, you know, around 2012 through 2014, I really noticed it getting bad. So here's another um, situation where they changed the fuel once again. The problem seems to have gotten worse. So every time I look at this, I keep going back to that. I also like to thank Max Bliss and Dane Wigington and even Mick West, the debunker, because I interviewed all of them as I was going through this process to try to get all sides of the story. Um, and I am, you know, I'm sticking to my guns on this one because like I said, jet biofuels enlisted for contrail control. This is the future. Um, this is the make cooling clouds by day, none by night um, solution that occurred after I went to the EPA in 2015 and testified. I'm not going to show you the testify, um, the testimony video today. Video is already running long. Um, but if you want to know more about this, you can actually look right here at my full report on what's called accidental geoengineering with ship tracks and contrails. Um, and the short and skinny of it is this. We are about to kill a massive accidental experiment in reducing global warming with ship tracks, as you can see over the Pacific Ocean right here, off the coast of Japan and China. Um, and then a forthcoming UN regulation will slash shipping industry pollution, but may also speed up climate change. Because studies have found that ships have a net cooling effect on the planet, despite belching out nearly a billion tons of carbon dioxide each year. So for ships, it's okay for them to fart CO2 because they also fart out a whole lot of carbon black dust because they use bunker fuel and that makes clouds. And by the way, they like clouds because they think they cool the planet. Oh, wait for it. It's not just them. Airplane contrails may be creating accidental geoengineering, 2015. Dissipating haze from plane exhaust alters how sunlight reaches the earth and may be unintentionally affecting our climate. Um, I cover both of these articles and everything in between in my article, Accidental Geoengineering with Ship Tracks and Contrails. You want to know more about that, please dig in. Um, but, you know, I'm glad that you guys sent these questions. Uh, you know, the, the one individual sent the question in. The other beautiful individual had a great tweet right at the ICAO, punch in the eye. High five on that, retweeted, liked, favorited, and shared in this video. Um, please keep your comments coming. Um, send me an email, comment on this video. Sharing is caring. I do appreciate everybody who um, has been supporting me over the years. You could do that by supporting me on Patreon or a one-time donation on PayPal or GoFundMe. It's always greatly appreciated. Um, please hit the sub button if you're new here or if you're watching this for the first time elsewhere because my videos are Creative Commons. Um, I will be probably uploading these to BitChute and Rumble and a couple other places in the near future. So, um, Guys, I hope that this has been informative for you. If this video resonated with you, please gently smush that like button. Leave me a comment and uh, you know share it with your friends and family. And uh, do it on platforms that probably aren't named 
Facebook or Twitter because they shadow banned all my content for quite a while. So it's pretty hard to get the word out there, but you can, you know, learn all this material yourself. That's why I've created this library of Alexandria of geoengineering for you to come and learn all this material yourself. You don't need um, to even reference me, learn the material, use the material, um, agree, disagree, fill in the gaps, read between the lines, help me better understand it. I'm always willing to learn where I'm wrong and learn more about the topic. So please share your information with me as well. Um, and understand that this is a complicated and highly argumentative topic. And it's probably the most argumentative topic I've had to deal with in a, the past decade. That's why I don't talk about it very often, because every time I do, um, the poo starts flying and the debunkers all crawl back out from under their woodwork. And I hope that, um, you know, this has brought some information that you can use. And with information comes power. And with power comes great responsibility. So I only ask that you use this information to attack ideas, not people. Love you, mean it, guys.